winter is coming. G'day and welcome back to another chilly episode on Tomo's Tune-Ups. On this episode, we are back on the Black Mosquito. We're going to be running the remaining brake and clutch lines. We're going to bleed the system and hopefully by the end of this episode, we have a brake and clutch pedal that is operational. So folks, welcome back to the channel. As I said, this is one of the first many cold episodes that I'm gonna be filming in the coming months. It is late May at the time of filming this, and we are starting to reach the single figures both morning and night down under. So the 6K run that I do during the week, as well as walking to the gym every morning, it is starting to get cold. So like I said, we're gonna be jumping back on the Black Mosquito. We're gonna get the clutch and brake fluids uh, filled up, bled, uh, everything's gonna hopefully go according to plan. I did off camera do a couple little things which we'll run through later, uh, but the first thing is a brake pipe which I will grab in a second and we're gonna talk about. And yes, for those of you out there, I am wearing Uggies or Ugg boots. So these are one of the remaining brake pipes that we need to run. This runs from the driver's side or the off side, depending where you are in the world. Uh, brake line and it goes to the driver's rear or right end rear and the passenger rear or left rear. Now this T-piece goes from here to the front which goes to the brake master cylinder. That uh, is different on this Mini because most of them have a proportioning valve. On this Mini we have a proportioning valve on the firewall mounted and then this one just has the T-piece. So most of them are the reverse, the proportioning valves at the back and the T-piece is on the firewall. Now, what is a proportioning valve and what does it do? Well, a proportioning valve proportions the amount of brake fluid going to either front or rear axle on the car. Now, why is it important to have it? On a system like this, if you do not have it, it is a crucial component because if you don't have it, you will find that one part of the circuit will brake harder and faster than the other. Now, although it may be necessary to have more braking force at the front of the car, which generally on most vehicles, it's 60% of braking force is done at the front, 40% done at the back. Although that is the most ideal situation to be in, the last thing you want is for it to be the opposite way. You come hooking into a corner, you hit the brakes, the rear end locks up, you skid, you aquaplane, and then you end up flipping and rolling the car and causing serious damage or death. So what this does is it prevents the amount of extra brake pressure going to the back and applies it to the front. So majority of the braking pressure we want done to the front and that's what the valve is doing. It's working out exactly how much pressure has been applied, how much is allowed to go through to the back compared to the front. You can get adjustable bias ones uh, from CAD, I believe, uh, as well as other manufacturers. You can also get an adjustable uh, piece that you could probably put in there as well from a brake supplier. Uh, even online as well, something like Willwood maybe. But those sort of applications are only generally used for motor car events, track events, any sort of racing. It's not really advised to run it in a street car. The proportioning valve here or an ABS unit will do exactly what you need it to. So in this situation, this T-piece is going at the back where the proportioning valve is, which we'll get to that in a second. I've had these two lines made up. So this is the replacement line for this side and then I'd have to just bend that into shape that I need it. And then this little one just goes onto the side. Oh, just down here, just like that. So that's gonna to go to the driver's side. So let's jump underneath the car. Let's get these connected and then start bleeding this car. All right, we got the pipes just here. We're gonna jump underneath and have a look at where we have to fit this stuff. So essentially, it's just up underneath here. So what we're gonna do is this is where it's going to become quite fun and interesting because we're going to have to fan doogle the uh, pipes inside there. Hopefully, we should be able to get it fitted up in there the correct way. So, we know that this one goes over here. We're going to run this one first to the left hand side. So I'm just going to attach this one. I'll just adjust the camera. Oh, 
so you can see especially with the light as well okay so I'm just attaching this one here first just with that flare nut I'm pretty sure it's the type of nut that it is yep cool that'll slide in there and then it will go up to this one and then we're going to grab the shorter one which is this one here and then that will just slide directly up under there all right so we're not tightening those all the way just that way we can readjust them that's the main pipe that comes from the front and then we've got a t-piece that'll go in here so this is the fun part we need to do is put all of these brake pipes in here get them all lined up all in there and then align it to the subframe and then tighten it up so i'm just doing one at a time here trying to get the, the best sort of angle that we can for them all make sure they're all started finger tight first obviously before sending it with a spanner to have done that one first I reckon we can bend that one back into shape as we need the good thing about these pipes is you can just bend them to the shape that you need unless you have them made specifically for this or they have been made um, adjusting them isn't going to be the end of the world especially when you're doing custom stuff like this you can generally buy all these pipes pre-made, I think, from Mini Spares uh, in the UK. So it's not the end of the world. If you can't, you can just go down to a local uh, brake specialist and just get them to make them all up for you. Now, when we put brake fluid in as well, it is advised to start, when you start bleeding the system, well, that is definitely not the right size. Uh, when you start bleeding the system, check all the fittings for any leaks. The last thing you want to do is just this in there pumping away the brake pedal or clutch pedal and then finding that brake fluid has just gone everywhere and it's just destroying your vehicle all right cool so that's in there now all we have to do uh, is just line that up with there which i'm not sure how we're going to do it we're going to have to probably manipulate and bend this a little bit to where we need it to be so i'm just going to straighten out that that pipe a little bit. All right. Then we grab our new bolt, send it in from the top. I reckon it's probably going to be the best way. It's going to keep it away from that cable. What if we push it the other way? That might be a bit easier to push it down on it. Yeah, there we go. Loosen that fitting off. All right, there we go. Yep, cool. Sweet. Now, have to reattach that. That's a bit of fan doogling I'm gonna have to do to get that on there properly. All right, so what I'm actually gonna do is now that I've got the, the bolt in there, I'm gonna grab the nut, the spring washer, and we're gonna refit it and then move it up just a fraction. Hopefully then, we're gonna put that brake pipe back on. Kind of a good problem to have, I guess, because you can always adjust it depending where it needs to go. Yeah, that'll pull itself straight in. We go and tighten up all these, and then once they're all tight, uh, we then tighten the nut and the bolt that's just there start putting some fluid in there and bleeding the system now it is also worthwhile noting that when you are doing up brake lines it may sound really dumb and you're probably thinking at home like why do you need to even say that do not over tighten brake hoses otherwise you will strip them you will crush the ends of them because they are made and designed to be able to fit in for instance like a male and a female joint 
If you over tighten it, you're gonna crush it, you're gonna mushroom it, it's gonna leak. And the last thing you want is a leak on something like a fuel or a brake system and impairing the drivability of the vehicle. All right, so here we are at the front of the car. Essentially, we now need to connect up the brake lines. So let's just have a quick look and see what uh, our apprentice Kev has done. So we've installed the brake and clutch master cylinders. The clutch master cylinders are actually loose. Thanks to that, Kev, wherever you are. Actually, he's not here at the moment. Thanks, mate. We'll come back and do that. So we've installed uh, both of these brake lines that go from here down there to the proportioning valve that sits on the firewall. Now that does need to be attached at the moment. It is loose. Uh, there is a quarter inch bolt, I believe, that goes through this way and attaches directly to the uh, proportioning valve. I've run that line all the way along the front, uh, secured that, so that's all fine. Now we just have to fit these pipes inside here. So that's not going to be an issue. However, this pipe here is, so this comes directly out the back of the turbocharger, goes down through there, goes out through the exhaust, out the back of the car. One issue that we're going to run into is that we probably need to insulate these or find out a way to insulate them to prevent the brake fluid and clutch fluid boiling. Now, I'm not entirely sure. I think I've got some uh, stuff down the back of the workshop somewhere. I believe that will enable us to use something like some heat shielding. Uh, definitely not in that one. Let's disregard all my stuff down here. My fridge, it's all my beer, not really. I don't drink beer, really. Uh, if we can get some like heat shielding, I'm pretty sure there's some in here somewhere. Anyway, if we can use that, uh, we can maybe insulate it enough so that way the heat from the turbo and the exhaust isn't going to overcook uh, the brake fluid that's in there. Brake fluid does have a pretty high boiling point. I think uh, dot four or dot five is about a hundred and 80, 190 degrees, I think. Um, I'm sure someone can um, let me know in the comment section below. And the exhaust system is gonna get significantly hotter than that. So we really just need to take that precaution and get ourselves some of this and probably just wrap them in there. I think that's probably a really good idea. I think I've only got the one lot of tubing, so I might need to get some more. But I definitely feel we do need to run this over the top to help prevent any heating issues. The last thing you want is brake fade. So brake fade is when the brake fluid boils. Uh, you can't compress liquid. So we'll just step it back a little bit. What actually happens is as the brake fluid heats up, it well, as liquid heats up, should I say. So for instance, you've got a kettle, the kettle boils. As it boils, it creates steam. That steam then turns into condensation. The condensation then cannot be compressed. So condensation is then going from a liquid to a gas back to a liquid. So it's that full cycle and that's how your brake fluid starts to break down over time. Brake fluid generally doesn't boil, but it is hydroscopic, which means it attracts moisture. Once that moisture gets in there, that's it, game over, done, see you later. So that's why it's important to change brake fluid on a regular basis. Regular, I mean generally every 30,000 or two years, whichever comes first. We actually had a car the other day, quickly off topic. Uh, it had done 24,000 kilometers in 14 months and it needed a brake fluid change. And we did it exactly 14 months ago or 24,000 Ks. So it is worthwhile noting uh, to make sure that you change brake fluid for that exact reason. Otherwise moisture in a braking system, you cannot uh, compress a liquid, um, especially a water, and that's when you generally get a hydraulic lock of an engine. Um, that's when you bend rods, all that sort of stuff, if you get water into the engine inside your car. All right, so we have our heat shrink wrap here. Essentially what I'm gonna do is just work out roughly how long I need it to be, maybe a little bit extra length, because you know, like I've said before, we can all do with a little bit extra length. Uh, put it in there and then just cut it and just have that little bit extra size on there that way it'll completely protect it and we're going to do both the clutch line and the brake line as well the brake line over here doesn't seem so bad uh, it's just this one here so the top one that runs from the master cylinder down to the proportioning valve uh, whereas the one that runs from the bottom of the master cylinder across it's 
pretty well clear. So I'd be pretty confident to say that's gonna be fine. So let's just cut this into the sort of correct length, I reckon, and then just fit it to the pipe and just see how it looks. As I said, we're gonna give that little bit extra length. That way we can ensure that if anything goes wrong, we can move it into position where we need it. I'm pretty sure this got fiberglass inside it. So when you're working with this stuff, just be super, super careful. You don't go and touch it because the last thing you want to do is be getting super, super itchy. Actually, we'll go up from the bottom. It'll probably be easier. Uh-huh, there we go. Yeah, so that's pretty much the pipe insulated. Look, it doesn't look very pretty but we can get some metal tires and tie it around there. But the fact that it's doing that job means that it's going to be preventing any sort of issues along the track uh, with the brake fluid boiling. You can get this stuff from places like Super Cheap Auto or any good automotive retailer. Uh, it's not overly expensive, which is good. It generally comes with a bunch of uh, steel cable ties. Just be super, super careful when fitting them because once you cut it off, it does create a massively sharp edge. So as long as you can get a good pair of pliers in there and just clip it and make sure that it's nice and clean and tidy, you're not gonna be cutting your wrists open every time you go to try to work on the car. All right, so that's protecting that. Fabulous. So just one at a time, I'm just gonna go ahead and attach the brake lines to the master cylinder to put some fluid in this and start the bleeding process. Now, I have spoken about uh, brake fluid bleeding on my channel quite, quite some time ago, I believe it was in the early days of Tomo's tune-ups. So make sure you go back and watch that if you haven't already. So there are a few ways in which you can bleed brakes. You can use a vacuum bleeder, you can use a pressure bleeder, you can use gravity methods, uh, you can use a two-person method, you can use a single-person method with a pipe going into a bottle of brake fluid, pumping it yourself. There's many, many, many different ways in which you can do it. So it's worthwhile noting that if you are going to do this, uh, just be very, very patient and probably have at least a litre and a half to two litres of brake fluid when bleeding a car um, from dry because it's going to take a lot of time to be able to push all the brake fluid all the way through and get all the air out of the system. It's worthwhile noting as well that these both have two different size uh, nuts on them, which is really quite odd. Now I don't need to put that one in just yet only because we still have to run the clutch slave cylinder, which I may actually need to take the turbo off uh, to be able to fit that because Apprentice Kev isn't here at the moment and you need, and I hate to say it and sound racist, but you need Asian hands to be able to get in here because there is not, not a lot of room. Even coming in from behind on top from the side, it's gonna be an absolute mission. It's when I also realized that we probably should have mounted this before putting it in the engine. Ah, the things you do when you're excited to start a build. Let's start the bleeding process. I'll just double check the tightness of these. I went and did this the other day. I did it off camera because I didn't see the point in filming how to assemble it. I probably should have, but you know, it'll be fine. Let's get some brake fluid pour in there. What we're gonna be using is dot four brake fluid. We probably could even go to dot five. It does have a high boiling point, like I said, but dot four would do the job. All right, next part is grabbing our fresh brake fluid and then topping up the system and bleeding it through. Now, as I said, this is gonna take quite some time to be able to properly fill up. So you're just gonna to have to be super patient with it. I do have a brake bleeding tool. Uh, it's a automatic refiller uh, that you stick on here. I'll see if I can find it. We were using it the other day on one of the projects I've got going on at the moment. And I don't know where we've put it. So. Uh, essentially, from now, we're just going to be pumping the brake pedal again and again and again to try and push all the brake fluid through. Any leaks, we will address it, make sure that we tighten all the fittings up. Uh, once we've pushed all the brake fluid through, uh, we then just need to apply um, either the brake fluid sucker or um, a, a small container with a little bit of brake fluid in the bottom 
uh, with a pipe going to it and just pump it through. That way we are only pushing out air and not sucking, sorry, yeah, we're pushing out all of the air, um, not sucking any back in because it's submerged in fluid as well. This is a really easy thing to do by yourself, but it is something that is gonna take quite some time, as I said, because it is a completely fresh system. It is just gonna take that little bit longer to be able to push all of the air through and get rid of all of the uh, air that's in the system. One thing that we've spoken about on the channel previously is the use of this tool. That is the Clevis pin holding tool. This helps to put that Clevis pin inside its little home, line it up, slide it in. Once it's in, you pull it straight out. And that way, saves all that heartache of trying to get the pin in there while it's doing it upside down, back to front, on your back. All right, so in all my years of being a mechanic, this has probably been one of the best tools that I've ever bought. This is the automatic refiller tool. I bought this from Snap-on, I think. Yeah, it's a blue point one. Pretty much you just fill it up uh, as much as you need and then you put the lid on it. It's got a pipe that goes down on the inside. Make sure you don't overfill it because then it won't bleed properly. The pipe, see you later spanner. Pipe sits directly down in there. Screw the lid on. It's got a little valve just here. You turn that one way, which will then enable it to come out or you turn it the other way and then that's what prevents it uh, from coming out. So essentially it has a little clip that clips onto the brake fluid uh, reservoir. So at the moment, the brake fluid is able to travel all the way through. So because it has that pipe that goes all the way to the top, it grabs the air from the top and allows it to drain all the way down. It's like one of those little cat or hamster uh, bottles that you grab a normal bottle and tip it upside down and it sits there. So it'll naturally hold itself there as the water gets lower and lower. Uh, in the bowl, it will then lower this as well. So it works on the exact same method. Really, really handy thing. You just have to make sure you keep an eye on this because once this is dry, you then only got, you know, your one or 200 mils available in the reservoir before it then runs dry and you increase the risk of uh, inducing air inside the braking or clutch system. All right, so essentially here, I'm gonna try and speed up the process a little bit. Just pull this little dust cap off the back of it. And then we're just gonna crack the nipple just to try and allow a bit of air in the system to be able to push any brake fluid all the way through. As I said, we do just need to make sure that we keep an eye on any leaks that may be apparent uh, throughout the entire system. It's pretty much got new everything uh, right from the wheel cylinders all the way through. Uh, there are a couple of old components that we've used, but hopefully, uh, once we start pumping it through, it should then start to get rid of all the air and just make it that little bit easier. All right, so just gonna grab our brake fluid sucker. Just gonna stick it on to the end of that hose and just leave it there. And that should give us enough to be able to pump all of the fluid out um, through the system, through the lines. That nipple is definitely loose, which is great. So pretty much we're just gonna be keeping an eye on here just to seeing any air bubbles or any brake fluid that's coming out. But as I said, it's a completely fresh system. So it's probably gonna take quite a lot of time before it actually starts to come out. It seems to be taking quite some time to build up any sort of pressure. And there's definitely no brake fluid coming out from there. So we just have to make sure that everything is working as per how it should be. All right, good and bad news. I have been pumping the absolute crap out of this master cylinder for at least 15 minutes. I was actually doing it while I was on the phone to the customer about it. Uh, essentially, half our problem is just here. See how much movement that thing has? That should be firm right from the start all the way through the end. It's only probably getting a quarter to a third of travel. So I'm thinking because it's been sitting around for so long, it's probably uh, leaking between the ports inside here and the uh, seals are gone. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna quickly whip this apart. It is getting late. I'm gonna continue on, but in YouTube time, it's gonna be the exact same episode. 
Uh, I'm gonna pull this apart and have a look, and if we need to, we're gonna do a brake master cylinder rebuild. Uh, if not, we're just gonna get a new one because there needs to be a little bit of movement at the end, but at this stage, like there's literally uh, half or three quarter um, movement out of the push rod before it actually starts to get firm. Even when it does get firm, there's nothing happening. I've cracked the lines that come out of here uh, to begin with and just pumped it. There should be fluid pumping out of here, or at least air bubbles, and there's nothing. And the level has not dropped whatsoever. So let's jump onto that uh, and I'll report back what I find. All right, so it's been a couple of days since we filmed that last part of this episode. Essentially, we pulled the old, or well, the new old master cylinder apart. And because this is a tandem system, tandem meaning two, there are two pistons inside there. There's one at the bottom and then there's one at the top. This one popped out quite easily. Essentially what you do is you strip it, you then apply a bit of compressed air here wearing safety glasses and it pops directly out the bottom, which is fabulous. It did exactly what it needed to. However, the top piston up here did not remove whatsoever. We tried for about an hour and couldn't get it out. So unfortunately, we had to go down the avenue of buying a brand new master cylinder. So you can actually see there the push rod is extended significantly further than what the original one was, which is then gonna give us exactly what we need to be able to bleed the brakes. So let's jump up to the front because we're not only gonna be installing this, uh, but also bleeding the clutch. One issue we ran into uh, was the dump pipe. So directly out of the turbo down through the exhaust, you can see how close this is down here with the two pipes. Even with some heat shielding on there, this pipe here, which runs from the clutch master cylinder down to the clutch slave, that's touching. This one here, that is also super close. As you know, exhaust systems are gonna get hot. This is probably gonna be at least two to 300 degrees easy. So when the car's cold, it's gonna be fine. The clutch and brakes will work fine. As soon as you get some temperature in it, forget it. You're gonna lose your brake and clutch. Um, actuation. So we need to get in contact with Jet Motors and see what they can do with this. We need to try and move the, the whole turbo system forward or at least reshape the manifold to give it the clearance we need. So that's going to be something that the customer is currently doing at the moment. Uh, at the moment we are up to fitting the brake master cylinder. I'm going to get them to bleed the clutch and then get onto the brakes. I've already done a video on that so I'm not going to go through and boys on how to do it. So if you haven't already checked it out on my channel, I'm going to go and do a couple of the dregs uh, kicking around and we'll touch base when it's done. Welcome back to another cold part of this chapter on the Black Mosquito. So it is coming into winter. We are so far 20 days into winter and it is absolutely freezing. So I know there's people out there who live in cold climates who you know deal with this sort of stuff all the time, but for majority of stuff down under, we're usually pretty warm. You're usually standing here in a t-shirt and shorts and you know explain things to you. I'm currently wearing a jumper, a set of trackies and Ugg boots. Probably can't see them. Um, essentially what you've seen so far is we got up to the point of fitting the brake master cylinder. We bred the, bled the clutch so far. Everything has gone fairly well up until fitting the brake master cylinder. Once we did, we then ran into some fairly big dramas and the dramas weren't you know massive and you know we had to stop the build but essentially from that last scene up until now it's probably been at least three weeks i reckon in between there we've been working on and off this um i've been stripping an engine which we've um just done as well in a previous episode uh we're still waiting on that we've got the gearbox here we're going to be rebuilding that but that's enough about that uh, and it also went to the Hay Mini Nationals as well, which if I haven't already released it, you will see that soon. So essentially we've been on and off the Black Mosquito for the last probably three weeks easy. Uh, where I got up to was we fit the new master cylinder. So this is the old one. That's just the reservoir at the moment. Uh, we fit it and it just was not bleeding at all. We sat there for probably 20 to 30 minutes. Each person, I had the customer, I had my apprentice Kev over here and we were just pumping the brakes to try to get this thing to bleed and it just would not bleed no matter what. We cracked the lines that go in, sorry, out of here from the master cylinder down to the uh, proportioning valve, I think it is, um, on the firewall. Cracked them, you could just, just, just get the littlest little drip out of one of the pipes. So it wasn't enough to really bleed it. When you're bleeding brakes like this and you're building a car and you're replacing everything, absolutely everything, it does make it hard because there's gonna be obviously air in the system. 
Now, I have done a video on how to bleed brakes on my channel. If you haven't already, please check it out. It's a pretty straightforward process. You can do it one of many ways. You can use a pressure bleeder, you can use a vacuum bleeder, you can use a two-person method, uh, you could even just use um, gravity, or you could just use something like a, a pipe going to brake fluid and just pumping the brake yourself. So all these means you can do either with yourself or with someone else. With this, I tried almost every single method that I was able to get my hands on. Now the problem we had was it had so much air in the system, but also the uh, brake master cylinder would not bleed. So I ended up taking it out and bench bleeding it. Now it is a good idea to bench bleed things prior to refitment or prior to fitment into a vehicle. It doesn't matter whether it's a classic mini, if it's a uh, Holden Rodeo, if it's a uh, D40 Navara, whatever it may be. It's always a good idea to bench bleed stuff. So it is a pretty straightforward process. Essentially, you just pull the brake fluid in, you put the cap on, uh, you put a bleed nipple where it comes out of the master cylinder. So whether it be a brake master cylinder, clutch master cylinder, uh, clutch slave cylinder, whatever it may be, essentially you want to be pouring brake fluid in and then pumping it and then cracking the nipple to let it bleed. Essentially, that just allows all the air to go out of there. And that way, you're not going to induce any air. Because a lot of the time you'll actually find is when you replace a brake master cylinder, for instance, you actually induce air in the system. So there's currently air obviously in this. Once you then fill it up with brake fluid, that air's got to go somewhere. If it doesn't go to the highest point, you're then going to be pushing that all through the lines. And that's what you need to, sorry, that's why you need to bleed the uh, brake system or even clutch system after you've replaced a component because you're going to induce air in there. Air is going to give a super spongy pedal the brake or clutch pedal are not going to react properly and you're going to have problems down the track so essentially i put a bleed nipple in each one of these and i just pumped it pumped it pumped it pumped it, pumped it. finally built up a bit of pressure cracked the nipple a little bit came out did it again cracked the nipple a little bit more came out and then eventually i had squirts of brake fluid coming out of each one of the the outlet pipes that go from the master cylinder down to the proportion valve so that was great so essentially what i'll do is um, fill it up with brake fluid in the reservoir. I would then get inside the car and just pump it by hand and just again and again and again to try to push that brake fluid through. And I would attach it also to the nipple as well. So because it's got a clear line on there, it's pretty easy that when you're pumping it, you can see the brake fluid starting to come out through and you can see the air as well. So I generally just wait till all the air has come out of the system in that line and then I know that that circuit so far is bled then move on to the next one so it did take a very very long time i think i probably bled this at least four times it does still have a little bit of a spongy pedal it is much better it is significantly better actually compared to what it was originally but we need to finish that off so i'll be doing that later essentially now all the brake brakes are bled always get that mixed up don't know why 20 years of saying it essentially the brakes are bled now, and what I'm gonna do is I'll probably get Kev to come around and just give me a hand just to finish bleeding them off, uh, just to make sure, because obviously when the car is stationary, you know, the brakes haven't been uh, bed in properly as well. Uh, they do need readjustment. You know, there's a lot of factors, you know, the car's on the ground, it doesn't have a booster, all that sort of stuff. It is worthwhile noting that until you take it for a test drive, you're not really going to know, but you're going to know pretty well straight away. You know, even just driving out the driveway, it's probably six or seven meters before I hit the tarmac. So even just driving it back and forth is going to give me a pretty good indication as how it's going to stop. So before you go on a massive road test, just, you know, drive it up and down your driveway, just have it in your street, don't have it on a hill or try not to anyway, depending where you live, I guess, and just get those brakes to see how it feels. If it doesn't feel right, bring it back in, jack it up and start again. Re-bleed them, check everything, make sure everything's fine. So essentially we've now bled the brake system. What I'm gonna do is start reassembling some stuff. Uh, we're gonna start at the uh, rear tailgate. I'm gonna work my way forward. At the moment, I've got the tank out on the left-hand side, which I'm gonna do a bit of a restoration job on. I'm just gonna lightly scuff it up with a bit of sandpaper, a bit of primer and just paint it. Um, and then I'm going to refit it inside the boot, which I'll do next episode. Uh, some of the wiring in the front, I'll start tidying up. I need to run wiring for the brake light, uh, not the brake light switch, sorry, the uh, reverse light switch, which I'll do off camera and just show you guys later. There's no real point touching on it again. I don't see the point. If I do miss anything, please let me know in the comment section below of things that you want to see me do. But yeah, I've got a heap of parts here, which I've you know been speaking about on Minisport, uh, the channel. 
Uh, but yeah, essentially that's another thing ticked off the list. So now that the brakes are done, it's pretty much, let's get this thing assembled from back to front. So anything that can go in, tail lights, uh, quarter lights, not quarter lights, sorry, uh, indicators on the front of the vehicle. Uh, the headlights are now in as well, so that's good. Uh, we can then uh, work our way through getting everything operational. Yes, that's my son's bike, or mine maybe. Uh, getting everything operational, so making sure that the indicators are correct. Uh, the indicators we actually got, I know we've spoken about before, but they are significantly wrong. Uh, and is not the type that we got, which is this one here. Apparently there's a third type available. Uh, compared to the original style that came out. So the original like little round ones that came out in the UK, little square ones, which is the ones that I got. They'd, the hole is just way too big and it's a super weird um, hole as well. So anyone that has any of these, please let me know. Uh, it'll probably be a little while until uh, we get the ones that we need. And probably since I've uh, released this episode as well, you'll probably find that I've already done it, but I'll put it out on social media if anyone's able to help. Also, uh, one issue that we did run into uh, is mounting the um, brake master cylinder and the lines that run down along here. Essentially what we found was these lines, even though this is heat wrapped, I had to heat wrap these pipes. Now these pipes were touching the exhaust pipe. So essentially uh, you got your manifold, it runs all the way down there. It then goes up to the turbo, the turbo then spools up and then goes back down through there and that goes to the tailpipe. Essentially, even though this is heat wrapped, that is gonna get super, super hot. And because the lines were touching, brake fluid has a boiling point of around 160 to 170 degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry, not Fahrenheit, 170 degrees centigrade. Because of that, uh, when the engine's cool, it'll be okay. When it starts to warm up and it gets a bit of heat, which this exhaust is well and truly gonna exceed probably 200 degrees, especially when you're giving it the berries, it's gonna start boiling brake fluid. Boiling brake fluid is not good. It is not what we want. So I've had to bend those lines back, but the guys from Jet Motors actually sent uh, a different plenum. I actually suggested that if we cut this pipe at about here, and then moved it forward, disregard my Mount Franklin bottle. I did spill some brake fluid and that's what it was on the inside of the car before, just down inside there on the ground, it wasn't brake fluid. If we cut that down there and then re-angled that pipe and then same with that one there and moved the whole turbo forward, got a smaller K&N air filter uh, or a K&N style air filter, then that would work perfectly because then all we really need is probably three to four inches between uh, the down pipe off the back of the turbo or the dump pipe, I think they call it nowadays, uh, and these pipes here. Essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna leave that set up, see what they gave us from jet motors, and then fit it inside here and see how it goes. Uh, and then probably send the car down to my brake specialist and get them to remake these hoses that run down to the proportion valve down on the firewall as well i think one of the clutch lines as well was pretty close you can see there like there's not a great deal of room and it's it was well set up and thought out but this was one of the first uh iterations of the jet motors engine build uh for the turbo stuff so yeah it was one of those things where you know they probably got a couple of things wrong and then revised it and revised and so forth and so on i think jeremy from jet motors actually reached out to the customer and, and gave him some stuff watched some of my videos and went yep this is what we need to do so that's where we're up to that's what we're doing uh there is yeah heaps more to do i'm just going to do some stuff off camera there is as i said some wiring that i just need to tidy up down around the front but as i said it is absolutely freezing at the moment that's why i'm wearing a hoodie uh, we've got a bunch of parts in the car, which is cool. Uh, but yeah, that's where I'm up to. That's what I'm going to be doing. I uh, hope you in 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 liked. I hope you liked the episode. And if you're liking the series, make sure you leave a little like below as well. It is super handy and helpful to um, help support my channel. And I do also have a super thanks button as well. You can leave a tip if you like. All that money goes back in the show, uh, especially my uh, first paycheck, in which I got from YouTube as well. I bought myself a little uh, little present, which if you guys know, you know. If you don't, well, then you'll find out soon enough. Uh, my wife wasn't overly happy that I spent that money on that. 
but you know, is what it is. So I'm going to keep chugging along in this, uh, and then next episode we'll probably get on to uh, the engine. We'll start remounting this thing because at the moment we don't have the whole engine properly secured in there. We need the the side engine mount. I need to clean it up actually, so I'm going to get that on the uh, sandblaster and then paint it put it on there and then we can start reassembling this. Need to put the radiator in, work out all that jazz and um, then work out some of the real estate that we need to do to fit the oil cooler, um, all that jazz. So that's it. Thanks for coming along for the journey. Really appreciate it. Hope you're enjoying the series. As I said, if there's anything you want to see me do or something that I may have skipped on, please let me know. For those people who've reached out so far and helped, thank you very much. Um, and to the people who've also left comments as well and uh, sent me messages on Instagram, letting me know that I've actually helped them uh, with their build as well, that really does mean a lot. So thank you very much for, for reaching out and, and letting me know that. It's, it's super handy to know that there's people out there who are not only willing to help me, but I can also help them because that is essentially what I aim to do on this channel. So before I keep blabbering on for more and more, thanks for watching. We'll catch you on the next episode of Tomo's Tune-Ups. And remember, stay COVID safe.